It was kind of like the Jenga block tower. The block at the very bottom for me was the Bible. And when that book started removing that <laughs> Jenga block on the inspiration of scripture, everything came down. Welcome to Voices of Deconversion. We share the inspirational stories of deconversion told by former Christians who are now atheist or agnostic. Our stories remind us we're in it together. They encourage us as we discover who we are and help us to embrace who we become. Now here's Steve with today's guest. Welcome back everyone for episode 24, part one. Today's guest lives near St. John, New Brunswick, Canada. He has a master's in theological studies from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, as well as a diploma in religious studies and ministry from McGill University in Montreal. He was baptized Anglican as a baby and came to faith in a Baptist church. He changed to Pentecostal and then later became a pastor at a vineyard church. He started his blog, Naked Pastor, in 2006 when he was still a Christian. In 2010, he left the professional paid clergy after almost 30 years in ministry. His art, cartoons, writings, and books have found their way all around the world. In today's interview, he explains the meaning behind the name Naked Pastor. He also talks about how he helps pastors who are leaving the ministry redo their resumes, which I thought was pretty cool. I really enjoyed this conversation, and you definitely have to check out, in particular, his cartoons. I've seen a few of them, and some are very thought-provoking, and others are hilarious. So you'll have to check those out at NakedPastor.com. Here's my interview with David Hayward. All right, well, David, thanks so much for joining me today. I appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, the first question I had for you is I wanted to ask, how'd you come up with the name Naked Pastor? <laughs> that's all, yeah, that's usually the first question. I, I, I started uh, blogging back in 2004 or five, and um, I had, I, I don't know, davidhayward.ca, and .ca is for Canada. And I, I, I was looking for a good name. And back at that time, I don't know if you remember um, the Naked Chef kind of thing. Oh. And, and uh, I thought of Naked Pastor. I was a pastor of a local congregation at the time. And so I, I tried to get the name Naked Pastor. Uh, it was, um, I, I was going to try to buy it. Anyway, I forgot all about it. And a few months later, I got an email. Congratulations, you won the auction. For a naked pastor and my heart <laughs> stopped because I thought oh no <laughs> oh you know I don't didn't have any money and anyway it ended up being something like 65 bucks and so I bought it and and basically the the name is it was I just wanted to be a, a pastor who was bearing his soul and just being real authentic vulnerable honest online about my joys and struggles uh, while being in the ministry so that's what the name represents now I left the ministry in 2010 and the church. And uh, so people saying, well, maybe naked pastor means you're a pastor without his church on. So <laughs> that's sort of a double entendre now. <laughs> yeah, that's kind so of funny. It's, it's pretty PG. You know, once in a while, my characters and my cartoons, they might swear, but there's no nudity or anything like that. But Yeah, yeah. Well, that's kind of a cool uh, meaning behind the name, though. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, like being transparent, that kind of thing. Being transparent. Yeah, everybody exactly. can kind of, yeah. And yep. um, so before I kind of, I have other questions for you about, about kind of what you do and stuff, but you said that, um, how do you, if someone says like, are you religious or, you know, mm -hmm. what do you call yourself? Uh, how would you answer that question? Well, I've always been interested in uh, the inner life. Uh, so for me, uh, I use the word spiritual, but I, I don't like the word to be honest, because it, it has so much baggage, right? Uh, it usually spiritual means we believe in, you know, uh, supernatural beings or, you know, this kind of thing. And uh, I, I don't lean that way. So for me, spiritual basically means uh, the inner life of a person. I think every person in the world has an inner life and uh, uh, strives or not to be a, a more whole uh, integrated, individu individuated human being 
And the journeys that we're on to achieve that for ourselves, that's what I would call spiritual. So some might call it psychological development or, or you know, um, something like that. But I, I use the word spiritual. Hopefully, um, most people would understand that that is not necessarily religious. Yeah. It, it basically means our, our, our inner life. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I, I agree with you. The, the term spiritual can be really difficult because it's such a religious word. It is such a religious word, yeah, and and it, it it now comes with all kinds of like we have on the one hand Christians who are suspicious of the word because it sounds new age, and then on the other hand you have new agers who might uh, embrace the word, and it has it comes with fairies and goddesses and you know all, all these kinds of things, and then on the other hand you might have say somebody like Carl Jung, the psychologist who yeah. used the term spiritual, but it 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 didn't necessarily mean uh, have any religious overtones. So yeah, there's this great book by a, uh, it's a French author and it's called the little book of atheist spirituality. Oh, and I, I love that title because that I read that a year or two after I deconverted and I was like so excited about it because it really did touch at the heart of like feeling awe in the universe or feeling a sense of spirituality, even though you don't believe in the supernatural and right. So I think it's I think it's cool that like that's something that, you know, is is important to you and kind of uh, maybe informs your your work or it kind of motivates you or or it's interesting. And it's it's it makes right. sense. You were a pastor. Right. So I like that uh, that differentiation between spiritual and supernatural. I don't yeah. ne- think that they necessarily have to intersect. Yeah. 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 That's great. I love that. So in 2006, you started the Naked Pastor blog, right? Right. Uh huh. And you said at that point you were still in the ministry. That's right. Okay. I was still in the ministry, and uh, I started blogging before that. But in 2006 or so, I took on the name Naked Pastor, and then I was I was um, inspired by a cartoonist. I I saw his work every day, and I thought, you know, I'm gonna. I, I was already an artist. I thought I can draw. I'm gonna try and do a cartoon every day, and see how long I can go. I gave myself a month. But here I am, 2017, still doing a cartoon every day, so um, and really enjoying it. I found it a powerful tool to. I usually draw it in one frame, and um, I, I find it. A, some people say a picture's worth a thousand words, and I, I find sometimes that's really true with my cartoons. I can convey a lot uh, and communicate a lot in one frame. So um, that's what I think Naked Pastor is mostly known for is the cartoons. But I, I also write, however. You know, I, I find the cartoons a very poignant way to getting to an issue. Yeah. And hitting the nerve. Yeah. And and so I, I get really positive and really negative responses to what I what I draw. <laughs> Which probably means you're doing something right. Because I think if if, you, so. if you're not upsetting anybody, then probably, you know, you're not really right. standing for anything, you know. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you about, I, I think, I was looking on your website today but i had i had looked at it earlier and it it said something about helping ex-clergy kind of with job skills can you talk about that a little bit yeah so i was in the ministry for pretty much 30 years and uh, i i had left the ministry a couple of times before um and you know having a family uh i had to scramble so one time i was a chimney sweep and another time I was I worked at Tim Hortons Donuts, and another time I sold batteries door to door. You know this kind of thing, just trying to scrape things by. But the last time, um, all those other times, I was intending to go back into the ministry at some point. However, the last time I left the ministry uh, and the church, I knew I was done, and that was a very traumatic time for me because I was in my young fifties. And thought, what the hell am I going to do? Like, I, I felt like all my education, all my training, all my experience was in religion, and you know what good is that in the real world? So it took me, it took me a long time to find my feet. I finally found a teaching position in a university for a while, and then uh, eventually I went on my own as an entrepreneur. But it was a scary transition, and uh, I needed a lot of. It took a lot of. Uh, courage and ingenuity and even uh, help from others to 
figure out how to make my resume. Let's talk about the resume. The resume used to be like a whole line, you know, line after line. It was all to do with religion, ministry, pastoral work, you know, preaching, et cetera, et cetera. And I had no idea how to convert that into worldly, secular language. Yeah. Eventually, I learned how to do it and um, came up with a resume because I believe many pastors are very highly skilled in many things that the world needs. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. And and so. I now help pastors who are leaving the ministry uh, redo their resumes. So, for example, they're skilled at, most pastors I know are very skilled at conflict resolution, uh, interpersonal relationships, counseling, teaching, fundraising, volunteer work, you know, uh, all that kind of thing. There's all kinds of things they're skilled at, but they don't know, they don't realize that, that it's, you know, often a pastor, a minister, a priest, whatever they're their worlds are so my, um, myopic that they don't realize that their skills are really translatable into the real world. So I'm seeing a lot of pastors now, ex-pastors, ex-ministers and so on, redoing their resume and getting really good jobs, doing something that they have been doing their whole lives, but now it's focused on a certain thing like uh, charitable organizations or volunteer organizations or GEOs or you know things like that. So uh, it's, it's really possible. It can be done. So I, I help I help pastors. What I say refit themselves for the real world. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, I really I really liked that when I saw that because um, I'm. Are you have you are you familiar with the clergy project? Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. yeah that that there's something similar there. I know that um, at one point they were trying to get uh, funding for some kind of like uh, job training type stuff for these ex clergy. So along the same lines, and I. I mean, to be honest, I think that's probably one of the, if not the biggest need for someone, practical need. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I'm talking like non-emotional because obviously like, you know, the emotions of going through a deconversion are difficult. But the most like pragmatic problem I feel like is what do you do now for a job? What do you do for work? You know? Yeah. So. Well, you know, the, the, the clergy project is really good at articulating the anguish a lot of pastors, ministers uh, feel while they're in the ministry and they feel like they don't have any options, right? Like, yeah. like I did, I, they feel trapped. Like they don't have any options. They don't, they don't know what the hell they're going to do. And I, I remember lying on my bed in the middle of the night thinking, what have I done? You know, when I quit the ministry, I thought, what have I done? What am I going to do here? I have a wife, three kids and a dog <laughs> in the house. And uh, I, I was, I was absolutely terrified. Wow. And uh, fortunately I had a little bit of, um, uh, I had a little bit of a severance package and I live in Canada. So, uh, I had an employment insurance that lasted me some months, but in, during those months I had to really scramble to figure out how to get a real job. Yeah. Cause it, it's not like someone who works in, you know, let's say, or it works for some industry, whatever it is, if they lose their job, they go look for jobs in that industry. If you're a pastor and you lose your job, you don't know what industry to jump into. And unless you've done the thinking like like you have, you've thought through, right. you know, here are the skills. They could be counselors. They could be teachers. They could, they could really be good at, like, solving conflicts. Unless you've yep. thought all that through, which if you're in the deconversion process early on, you haven't, it's going to mm. be complete, like, like you said, you were scrambling, you know? Yeah, like the... For for it's one thing for people to leave the church, just you know regular people leaving the church and, and uh, leaving their religion or whatever. For a pastor, it's you know just jumps you know incredibly the, the the stress because as a pastor, you're doing something that's your life, it's your vocation, it's not just a job. You're on twenty four seven, and that's you're totally totally a specialist, an expert at being a pastor or whatever. And then, you know, you're right. When, when you lose that, it's, it's like, what, you know, what, what the heck am I going to do? You have to, you're, you have to, to, you feel like you have to totally recreate yourself from scratch and whatever age you're at. I was like 50 ish. Uh, that's, that's a horrifying thing. I, I imagine myself being the greeter at Walmart, you know, no, I'm not disparaging that job. I'm just saying that's what I imagine, you know, that I might, that the only thing I was really maybe qualified for was I was old enough <laughs> and I could speak 
or whatever. And I could say, you know, here's your cart. You can't take your bag in kind of thing, you know? So it was, uh, it was a horrifying, terrifying experience. And fortunately I, I, you know, got a job at a university te teaching English as a second language to international students. But that's cool. But then, uh, I, I'm an artist. I have skills. So I, I have a, I'm an artist. I, I do a lot of work online and so on. And I, I was able to, in a couple of years, do that solely. So now I'm a, basically I'm self-employed. And, but that, that took, you know, it took me a good seven years really to climatize yeah. to the new environment. Wow. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and um, jump into your story. I, you know, this stuff may come up uh, more in a, uh, there's a lot about what you do that's really fascinating and really, really awesome, I think. So, thank you. Yeah. Well, I guess let's start with uh, just how Christianity was a part of your childhood growing up and, and the influence it had on you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I grew up in a Christian home and uh, I was baptized as a baby in the Anglican church, Episcopal down there, I guess. Sporadic going to church here and there and everywhere. I became a Christian got saved, whatever you want to call it, when I was around 15 years old in a Baptist church. We became members there. I got baptized again uh, uh, because infant baptism doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> we moved from there to Pentecostal. And then from there, I went to Bible college in Springfield, Missouri. That's where I met my wife. And then from there, I went to seminary at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary in Boston. And then from there, I joined the Presbyterian Church, and then I went to start studying my Ph.D. at University of Toronto in Biblical Studies. We got pregnant. I ended up going to McGill University to finish a ministry degree. And then I got ordained in the Presbyterian Church, where I was for maybe 12 years. Oh, wow. And then I switched from that to Vineyard. And the Vineyard Movement, I don't know if you've heard yeah. of that. Oh, but... yeah. I was. That was actually a big part of uh, my kind of... When I was a teenager, uh, that was that the whole Toronto blessing thing was going around. Well, there you go. You know all about it. So that was the last uh, movement or denomination, whatever you want to call it, that I was in. And then that's where I, I left the ministry. Wow. Yeah. Religion, spirituality, uh, Christianity, the church, pastoring. That was like, you know, that was my whole gig. Whole life. Yeah. Well, when you were younger, you said you grew up Anglican, right? Uh, well, I was baptized Anglican, but we hopped around. Okay. So yeah. you guys moved around a lot. So when you were 15 years old, yeah. uh, how did your faith change for you? I mean, because you kind of mentioned that as a, uh, when you got saved or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I got, I, got, I, I got born again. Like I was, that's where it became personal. And, um, you know, I was at a boys club meeting. We were playing floor hockey. And uh, then the youth leader preached the sermon at the end, hellfire and brimstone kind of thing. And then I was terrified, so I decided I better get saved. And uh, we were told to sit around the outside of the gym. And he he came to me and he passed me the four spiritual laws <laughs> and said, read that. He prayed with me. And I went home and I said, Mom, guess what? I'm saved. <laughs> oh, wow. It was just like that. But then, but then it became very, very much who I was. Like I got heavily involved in the church, youth group, Christian rock bands, you know, the whole thing. And uh, I was a very devoted believer, you know, went to Bible college, the whole seminary. Yeah. So yeah, I, I was in a hundred percent. So tell me about your siblings or your parents. How was, how was their faith different from yours or was it kind of similar within your family? I was, yeah, it was all similar. Uh, I, I was the oldest of five. Um, basically, we all followed suit, just to make a long story short. Sure, sure. It was when I, I went to Bible college, and uh, it was a Pentecostal Bible college. And then I went to an evangelical seminary, Gordon Conwell. That's when my beliefs started to get challenged. Mm. Even though it was an evangelical seminary, for some reason, I was reading books not recommended. Uh, I was tumbling across other authors and theologians, philosophers that weren't on the reading list. Just on your own because you were, you were looking through the library or something? Or yeah, well, I, I can't curiosity. remember how, but I somehow got my hands on this book called The Silence of Jesus by James Breach. Hmm. He was a, a theologian at 
York University in Toronto. I don't know how I got the book. It wasn't on any reading list. And basically, he he claimed that uh, the only seven authentic sayings of Jesus came down to these seven statements. And then he started to deconstruct those. And he was a, also a Nietzschean philosopher. Ooh, interesting. I'll tell you that book devastated me because the the cornerstone of my belief system was the inspiration and inerrancy of scripture. Yeah. And it was kind of like the Jenga block tower. The block at the very bottom for me was the Bible. And when that book started removing that <laughs> Jenga block mm -hmm. on the inspiration of scripture, everything came down. I mean, it was, it was, it was one of the most traumatic experiences of my life. And this happened the day I was being, I was graduating from seminary. Uh, when I, I was panicking, I was freaking out. Wow. I didn't know I was, I didn't know what to do because my whole belief system was crumbling. Yeah. So this was in, this is when you graduated from seminary, you said? That's right. Back in 82. So you had gotten your, your bachelor's degree and then from there is when you went right to seminary. Right. Right. All right. And so, and up to, up to the point when you started reading some of these books, everything was going along as it should have as a Christian. You were right. What was your plan? Were you going to, did you plan to be a pastor? Actually, I didn't quite finish your previous question. Like, so up to that point, up to seminary, my relationship with my family and everything was pretty, you know, we were pretty much on the same page, but then uh, after graduation, that's when I started feeling myself drifting apart and feeling tension between my beliefs and my family's beliefs. Yeah. And yeah. those tensions still exist today. Uh, oh, wow. They're still, you know, my parents are still faithful churchgoers. So there's that, there's still that tension today. I went to seminary um, and then on to study my PhD in biblical theology because I wanted to be a professor of biblical studies. You know, I just couldn't make it because of, you know, Lisa, we got pregnant and uh, I just couldn't continue my studies. And I was given a way out by being offered to, my, my, my master's degree was the two year scholarly degree. And so I needed one more year to top up my studies in order to have the equivalent of an MDiv, okay. Master of Divinity, in order to do ministry. So I went to McGill, did that one year and then got ordained and then I was in I was in my vocation as a pastor. I just sort of ended up there accidentally. And uh, that's where I, you know, remained for the rest of my days. Yeah. Wow. So you, um, you were, you were losing, you were losing your faith at the end of seminary. Mm -hmm. And did you consider yourself a Christian when you left seminary then? Oh yeah, absolutely. So you were still, you were struggling, but you were, you were still kind of wrestling yeah. with your faith. I, yeah, I held on to my faith. And um, uh, so for me, my problem was, how do I reconcile my inner experience with all this data <laughs> that was coming in? Yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, for example, the inspiration of scripture not being true and all that kind of thing. So uh, I was willing so most people, you have an option, right? One option is you totally embrace the data and you reject your faith. For me, I wasn't willing to do that yet. I, I, I figured there must be a way to figure this out, reconcile this. So it wasn't until um, like 30 years later. Yeah, okay. That's what I was going to say because in my mind, like I thought when we were talking that there was this huge gap. So that makes that pieces it together. Well, I lived in cognitive dissonance for over 30 years. It's, you yep. know, if I hadn't gone through my own version of that, I wouldn't believe that. Like, I, I would not that I wouldn't believe you. Right. But it right. just seems crazy. Like you went 30 years just <laughs> having these two basically completely opposite understandings of the world and, and, and religion and stuff. And somehow they coexisted for that 30 year yeah. period. Yeah. For, for, yeah. for, yeah, for me, God, I don't know how long it was. I mean, it was kind of a progressive thing, but, um, but I absolutely was in complete denial of what was happening to my faith. So I really associate a lot with, you know, kind of, oh, I'm still a Christian. Yeah, okay, well, I just have some different beliefs or whatever. I don't know if that was similar yeah. for you. 
Yeah, so I, 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 one of my books, I have several books out right now, but one of my books, Questions Are the Answer, is it, it sort of describes my journey. And I got to the point, uh, in, in, in 2009, I had a very powerful dream that uh, when I woke up, it was, it, it sort of solved all of my problems. I, I had immediate peace of mind and it hasn't gone away. So it's, it's permanent. Wow. But the, the, the mental theological anguish I'd been living in for so long was suddenly gone. And I, I had this peace of mind because what I saw in the dream, if I could explain it, what I saw in the dream was a waterfall. And I knew I was looking up at this huge waterfall and I knew over the rim was that which we cannot see. And then we see the waterfalls coming over and then it's splashing over the land. So I, I realized that it's all a matter of perception. And I, I realized that everybody, no matter where you're standing in relation to the waterfall, what you perceive is what you think you know. And what you think you know is what you believe. And so I, I realized that no matter from wherever I was standing or wherever anybody was standing, it was just, it was all a matter of perception. We're all seeing the same thing. We're all experiencing the same thing. But the way we apprehend it is our own paradigm. And then the way we try to articulate it is with our own language. So for me, the only thing that seems to separate us or divide us is words, language, and and perception, and so that that to me it was you know it there was immediate peace of mind about it all because I realized hey, you know, we're all experiencing the same thing, but it's it's just our language that seems to divide us. So for me that was a huge breakthrough, and that was and when you were kind of going through deconstruction or deconversion is when you had this dream. That was in 2009. And then that, when I started writing about that, uh, that's when people started saying, oh, he no longer believes in God. He's, he can't be a pastor. And within the year, I was gone. Wow. So yeah. you were yeah. in cognitive dissonance up to that point. So you hadn't really acknowledged that you might be losing your faith or... Had you thought about it much? Well, so Up for to me, that point? well, uh, for me now, it's it's really hard to articulate and explain. But for me, the word faith and belief and all that no longer has meaning. <laughs> it's 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 like, uh, what do you what do you describe? Some people say I believe this when somebody could say, well, I I know this, or somebody else could say I experience this, or or I intuit this, or whatever. So for me, I I, I somehow uh, I never lost anything that I didn't have, <laughs> you know. So it's like it's it's I I have this I have this understanding from my perspective that. Uh, so, for, for example, you and I, mm -hmm. I believe we're in the same world, we're experiencing the same thing. The way you describe your reality and the language you use, the way you understand it, that's your perception. The way I understand it and try to describe it and articulate it, that's my perception. So, uh, I think we need to dialogue and communicate to try to understand what is the best way to understand and articulate reality. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why I think it's so important for us to embrace science and philosophy and uh, communication and so on. So did I lose my faith? I don't know what that really means anymore. Yeah, you know? it's it's not a great phrase. And it's very, it's quite negative. Like it was something amazing that you lost. You know, it's a bad yeah. experience. But in the end, a lot of us feel like it's a good experience. It may oh, be yeah. hard, but it's in the end, it's a positive. Mm -hmm. oh, and, yeah. and I liked how you put it that you didn't lose, you lost something that you never had. So although now you and I can talk about how, you know, we're happier, um, I'm sure there was some, some difficulty in embracing that. Uh, I mean, would you say that while you, you know, when you recognize that you 
were no longer a Christian, would you say that that was, uh, was that a difficult thing to accept? Yeah. So a lot of people say, oh, you're not a Christian. To that person, I'd say, well, I'm probably a better Christian than you are. <laughs> or somebody might say, oh, you're an atheist. And I'm saying, well, like, what do we mean by that? Or what do we, you know, so it's, it's like, these are just labels. They, they really are just labels. Yeah. And so, so I, sometimes I say, I, I may be a Christian, but I have cottages everywhere, you know, and uh, it's like, I remember Gandhi saying, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a Hindu, I'm a Jew, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. To me, those are labels that are attempts to, um, sometimes they're attempts to divide us and separate us and distinguish us. When, when I'm more interested in, in the fact that uh, what, is, what is true, what is, what's behind the words, what's behind, you know, the perception, uh, that's what I'm really interested in. So, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in reading quantum mechanics, you know, David, uh, quantum physics, David Bohm, uh, one of my favorite philosophers, still alive, Slavo Zizek, you know, um, these guys are really onto something, exploring, okay, what's, what's beyond the words? Did the, you know, deconstruction philosophy, that to me is, is very valuable. And I wish, I went, it's funny, uh, the Vineyard, they, they hosted a, a workshop, a weekend workshop on they wanted to prove deconstruction wrong. And so we, they had us reading all these books on deconstruction. And then when we got there, they were going to prove how it, it's not wrong and that scripture is true and we need to trust it and believe it. And anyway, I ended up believing that a deconstructionist, like it, it totally didn't work for me. And I, it, it was, I was just so amazed uh, by the whole deconstruction idea. But that, would you would you explain that just briefly? Because um, in my mind, I hear deconstruction. Actually, I feel like people use that in in our kind of sphere to talk about people losing their faith, like right. they deconstructed their faith. What do you mean when you're saying deconstruction? Well, that's I, that's the way I use the word now. We've okay. co-opted it. We've so co-opted the, it. Okay, so the Vineyard actually had a course. The Vineyard Church had a cor- Your church had a course on right. deconstruction. Yeah. So wow. as a hermeneutic. Uh, for understanding the Bible, they they wanted to convince me that there there is objective truth. The Bible is objective truth, and the the whole role of a deconstructionist hermeneutic would be uh, that what we're reading are other people's interpretation of what they think is the truth, uh, and and so they would that would be the deconstruction thing, and but now with the you know ex Christians or progressive Christians or whatever. They're, they've co-opted the word to mean we're a demolishing of our beliefs. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And um, just real briefly, for I, I think there's probably going to be a good number of people that don't, don't know what the Vineyard Church is. Could you just explain what kind of church it was? So the Vineyard Church is an evangelical movement. It began in the, I don't know what, by John Wimber in California in, I don't know, the 70s maybe? Uh or, and uh, they, they're very evangelical, orthodox kind of theology. Um, not, I wouldn't even call them progressive. They're pretty middle-of-the-road evangelical. But they're, they're very uh, down-to-earth in, in the way you dress. You go to church. Their worship music is like bands that play contemporary. Re- they very, really strive to be relevant. So and they also have a Pentecostal twist, charismatic twist to it, with believing in spiritual gifts and prophecy and uh, you know laying on of hands and healing and all all that kind of thing. So then the last Vineyard Church that I pastored was really cool. You know, younger, uh, the the music was awesome. Uh, you just hang out, drink coffee, uh, very relaxed. My messages were also always conversational one back and forth with the congregation. So it's, it's very kind of hip and very relevant. They try to be very relevant and um, appeal to the younger, younger group. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I experienced it. And the churches I went to that were kind of uh, either in, they were mostly, I think, emulating the, the vineyard church, but I mean, all that was very true. The, the charismatic piece and the Pentecostal piece was huge at the churches. Uh, one of the churches in particular that uh, I would go to. It was called Seattle Revival Center. 
<laughs> oh god yeah anyway <laughs> so i was really interested when you were saying you know when you began to start writing people mm -hmm. started to say he can't be a pastor so so um what uh, once again what what provoked you to start doing the writing or what prompted you to start because i was a blogger and I wrote, I was writing about my experiences and the point of Naked Pastor was me to be vulnerable and transparent. So I was just writing, hey, I had this powerful dream, an immediate peace of mind after 30 years of theological anguish. And I have this peace of mind and here's what I'm, I'm trying to unpack this dream, right? Trying to explain what I saw. And I'm not being all woo woo about this. This is just a dream, right? Yeah. And uh, it just like was a, it unlocked the door for me and open a window or whatever. And so I was just trying to describe it. You know, some people call it God and, you know, uh, uh, a Jew might call it uh, Yahweh and a Buddhist might call it, you know, Nirvana or the Buddha or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I, this, this three-way thing I saw, for a Christian, they might describe it as God, that which we cannot see. Yeah. And then what comes over the falls is uh, the incarnation of Jesus the revelation of what's unseen and then where it spreads out across the land that's the holy spirit where it moves out across and affects all people but but a jew might see that as yahweh or and then and then moses and the torah and then the the synagogue um and then a, a buddhist might describe it as the buddha and then the manifestation of the buddha and then the sutras you know and so on and and the sangha the community uh, an atheist might describe it as the undiscovered and then the discovered and then the application of what's discovered, you know, so yeah. for me, it's perception. And so when I was trying to describe, it's all about perception. And this is this is what I think. This Well, then people were like, oh, my God, you know, he, he doesn't believe in God anymore, because for me, religion, it's all about. Well, not just religion. It's all groups want to be exclusive. They want to be right. Yeah. They want to be the best. And so we use exclusive language. If you don't say these words, if you don't describe reality with this using this language, then you can't be a part of this. And so I was exploring the whole idea that I don't, you know, our language is being exclusive. Is there a way that we can describe reality in a way that's that integrates or in, is inclusive and so on? Um, up to that point, had you received much criticism for your personal beliefs that as they were evolving? Well, uh, so naked pastor, my blog, my cartoons, they critique, I often critique the church and what, you know, and Christianity and religion, what's toxic about it, what's abusive about it, coercive or, uh, manipulative about it or silly. You know, I would critique those things. So a lot of people don't like that. And um, so I, I did receive criticism for that kind of stuff. And some of my ideas, you know, for example, I believe that it was possible to be a totally democratic community, that I didn't have to be an autocratic, authoritative leader, um, that somehow we could all be a team and work together. And so that I found a lot of uh, kickback on that from pastors and churches. Interesting. Who, yeah, people really do want a strong leader. Charismatic leadership is so so many people really want it and i i was working the other way and so a lot of people criticized that but when i really started writing in 2009 about what well, i call this the z theory when i started writing about this that's when i really started getting in trouble i even got calls from higher ups in the vineyard saying that they wanted to edit my posts oh man before i published them and everything and i knew i knew i could hear the clock ticking then of course at that point it's like they're essentially investigating you. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <it's talking. laughs> Trying to filter things that you're saying. I mean, to me, in any area of life, when someone is silenced like that, there's a there's clearly a problem. Like the structure yeah. of the vineyard church, like it's it's a, you're exposing something at that point. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. that's something they don't want to they don't want, you know, because you're going to start influencing your congregation and they don't want yeah. that. You know, no, that's right. Yeah. And how how did you receive the criticism you were beginning to get at that point? I got worried. Um, first of all, my greatest 
fear is being trapped. I don't want to be trapped or controlled. And that was where they were trying to head me. Uh, they were trying to rein me in, manage me, control me. And I, I can't handle that. I just can't. And I can't handle that with, for other people either. Like I really want people to be free and experience freedom. I was, I was worried because I knew one of two things, either they were going to kick me out for heresy or I wasn't going to be able to withstand the pressure anymore to conform to their expectations. And, and I was right. Like it was within a year that, um, I, I resigned. What was the final straw when you realized, okay, I have to, I have to resign now. I remember the night it was, uh, some of my greatest supporters, uh, we were together having just a, not really even a meeting. We were having drinks and talking in somebody's living room and, they were just starting to talk about how they were uh, frustrated. They wanted, you know, there was concerns about my beliefs. Uh, they were ex just expressing some dissatisfaction with me as a pastor. And I knew, mm. I knew at that point, I knew very clearly at that point I was done because they were my greatest supporters. They'd always had my back. And I knew at this point that I was losing favor yeah. with the congregation and so when I left that night, I actually texted my wife who was at work and I said, I'm, I'm done. I, that's all I texted. I'm done. Wow. And, and she texted back and said, me too. <laughs> wow. So we haven't talked about her or your kids or anything in, during this yeah. time. So how were they all responding to what you were going through? Lisa and I, that's another issue in terms of the ministry and everything. That yeah. was fine we were very much on the same page and knew this had to happen. Our kids were all young adults and had minds of their own anyway. They, they all came to church. They were all involved in the worship bands and all this kind of thing too. Mm -hmm. But we were done. Everybody was done. And, you know, they're all walking their own paths now and they're very wonderful people. Yeah. Uh, but Lisa and I, in terms of just our relationship with the church, that, that was easy. The difficult part was the deconstruction part where we we'd grown up together. Basically, we got married when she was 19 and we basically grown up together on the same page theologically. And all of a sudden we were no longer on the same page. So she she still even though you guys were on the same page with the church, obviously you guys were like, OK, we're done with this vineyard church. We're done with being a pastor. That's, right. that's over. But right. she was still a Christian. And did you consider yourself a Christian at that point? Yeah, I did. And you know what? I. I would still, Slavoj Žižek, the philosopher, he, he calls himself a Christian atheist. Maybe that's a good title for me uh, because, uh, you know, I, I still don't believe in supernatural beings, but it, it it's a tempting title. It, it's a cultural thing. It's like uh, Jewish folks will consider themselves Jewish. They identify right. with the culture and the traditions, but they don't believe in the supernatural. They might even go to synagogue and, you know, but yeah, yeah it's to me, it's similar to that. And I, I do identify in that in that sense, too. So I like to stay in the game just because I, I, I believe I'm helping reshape the language and and check the attitudes and maybe even cause a little bit of reform. I don't know. Maybe I am. Yeah. I hope I am. Anyway, so Lisa and I. In terms of our relationship with the church, we were totally on the same page. But what was interesting and what was a real challenge for us, and it took a lot of work and for you know some therapy and everything like that. We're still together, by the way. I'll just give you the end of the story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I went for a, a very rough period where you know it was like the perfect storm. I I left the ministry. It was my whole life, my whole vocation. So I left behind a paycheck. Our kids all were, we were suddenly empty nesters. Our kids had all left home. Uh, we had to file for bankruptcy because, uh, you know, just years of ministry drove us into the ground financially. <laughs> and Lisa had started university to get her nursing degree. You know, all these things came at the same time. It was a perfect storm and I was a mess. I, I was really a mess. Be sure to hear the second half of David's story next week in part two of this interview. He has some very encouraging words for those deconverting today and some excellent resources. Thanks for listening to Voices of Deconversion. Be sure to join us next time by subscribing to the podcast. If you have a deconversion story you would like to share, email us at steve at vodpodcast.com.